Hello everyone, and thank you for joining us this evening. My name is Elizabeth Rigo, and I'm your host for tonight's Mass Support Town Hall, Shelter from the Storm. Because housing insecurity continues to increase during this pandemic, we would like to share some helpful information and resources relative to housing assistance. Really excited tonight to have some really interesting and informative panelists with us. We have David Yordania, an Assistant Attorney General. And we also have Yarlenis Villeman, an Outreach Director, Community Engagement Division Office of the Attorney General. You'll also be hearing from Amy Mullen from Raft and Irma Program Overview and our very own Colby Andrade from Mass Support. Let me tell you a little bit about Mass Support. Mass Support is a crisis counseling program and it provides free, anonymous, confidential support, counseling resources, referrals to people of all ages in Massachusetts. We are also doing group services, consulting for organizations and businesses. We are educating on traumatic stress, resilience building, coping strategies, and more. We are made up of diverse teams statewide with approximately 54 counselors and clinicians that speak multiple languages. Mass Support is funded by the Federal Emergency Management Agency, FEMA, and managed in partnership with the Massachusetts Department of Mental Health and Riverside Trauma Center, a service of Riverside Community Care. So without further ado, let me go ahead and introduce our panelists. Yelenis Villeman is an outreach director within Massachusetts Attorney General Maura Healy's community engagement team. Yelenis has worked on issues and educational campaigns ranging from workers' rights, landlord and tenant rights, immigrants' rights, and everything in between. Yelenis holds a master's in public administration from Suffolk University in Boston, Mass, and a Bachelor of Arts from College of Holy Cross in Worcester, Massachusetts. David Eugenio is an Assistant Attorney General in the Civil Rights Division of the Attorney General's Office. Before he joined the Civil Rights Division, David worked with immigrant worker communities in New York City as an employment lawyer. Thank you so much for being here with us. Thank you so much, Elizabeth, for the brief introduction. Good evening, everyone. And thank you again, Mass Support, for organizing this amazing event and for inviting um, our colleagues from the Attorney General's Office to present on today's important topics on landlord and tenant rights. As Elizabeth mentioned, my name is Jalenis Villeman and I'm an outreach director in the Community Engagement Division. It is a pleasure to be here today. And I'm also here with my colleague, David Oreña, who's the Assistant Attorney General in the Civil Rights Division. Before I give the platform to my colleague, David Oreña, I'm just gonna give you all a little overview of our office and what we do, where we located and how we can continue to serve each and every one of you. On the next slide, I'm just gonna give you a little overview about who the Attorney General is. The Attorney General, her name is Mara Healy and she's the Chief Lawyer and Law Enforcement Officer of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. I will give you a couple examples on the next coming slides, how we enforce the law in the state of Massachusetts and also how we can serve you. But on the next slide, I wanna give you just a little information about where we located um, throughout the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. So one important um, on your screen, you're gonna be seeing a map. If you double click again, um, you will see in the Boston, we are, have our main headquarters in Boston where we have two offices, one in one Ashburton place 
and the other one at 100 Cambridge Street. But we're also located in New Bedford in the southern part of Massachusetts, as well as the central part of Massachusetts as Worcester and the western part of Massachusetts as Springfield. We want to make sure for those of you who have joined us today from different parts of the area, just know that any of the locations that we are located, you can go. Um, unfortunately, and this is where the next slide will explain due to the pandemic um, and health crisis we're undergoing because of COVID-19, our office is currently entirely virtually, but we still remain committed to serving members of the Commonwealth and all our hotlines are fully staffed during our regular hours. Um, Walk-ins are encouraged to file complaints online or to call our office. And I'm gonna give you all the hotlines information that you should know at the end of today's presentation where you can have a direct phone number where you can call us. We are open Monday to Friday from nine to five, at, from nine to 5 p.m. But just know as well, that if you have clients that speak another language, we have the service and the capacity to serve anybody in the state of Massachusetts in whatever language they feel comfortable. We wanna make sure that we, men we still maintain to be a transparent state agency serving everybody around the state of Massachusetts. So one important information is the who and how we serve. The who, we serve every single resident of the Commonwealth and their public interests. But one important information, especially when we talk about the word resident, it is, I don't wanna say if somebody with a green card or legal status, is anybody that lives in this Commonwealth, no matter their legal status, if you are an undocumented immigrant living in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, we still serve you as long as you live in this Commonwealth of Massachusetts. We also serve state departments, officers and commission, as well as group of consumers. And I'm gonna give you a few examples. We are all group of consumers. We love shopping, um, we have um, businesses. So one important information, especially throughout the holidays right now, many of you are shopping online. And let's say for example, that you buy the newest electronic device right now, but the store you purchased that device um, gave you a deceptive product that does not work and you have issue getting a return policy or getting back, hearing back from that particular store that you potentially bought online. If you have issues like that as a consumer, we can help you and assist you. If you need help with any healthcare um, questions, we can help you as well. Or if you are a worker and you have uh, clients who are workers right now to have questions about the earned sick time or the minimum wage or their employer hasn't paid them what they're supposed to, please urge them that they can call our office and we can help them as well. There are other consumer related um, issues that we can help and all our services are completely free. Now, there are four major ways that we work in our office. One of them is investigation. We do a lot of investigating work in our office, especially as it relates to um, workers violation in the state. We do the enforcement part as well, especially as the minimum wage is changing. And next year, every worker who are, who are being paid the minimum wage are supposed to be paid $13.75. So one important information, we wanna make sure that the laws are enforced here in the Commonwealth, that also the policy, we work with every elected official throughout the Commonwealth. We advocate on different type of legislation. We don't write the law, those are your elected officials. Um, but we also do the prevention part in our office, and this is where we are today. Our office, our division was um, created by the Attorney General herself during her first term to make sure everybody in this Commonwealth knew about the resources and services that we can offer and also know that you have rights. And this is the best way we can educate you, especially on today's topic related to housing. On the next slide, um, I'm going to give the platform to my colleague, David Ureña, who works in the, under the Department of the Public Protection and Advocacy Bureau in our office. Just one second as I work through a technical uh, issue on my end.
Great. Um, hello, everyone. My name is David Ureña. I'm an assistant attorney general in the Civil Rights Division at the Massachusetts Attorney General's Office. So I want to talk with you tonight about um, some basic uh, landlord and tenant rights and obligations that would be helpful to, to know at this time. And I'll briefly cover some information pertaining to um, the current uh, eviction crisis and uh, resources that are available uh, for landlords and tenants. And um, um, I guess if we could just move on to the next uh, slide. I think at the bottom, you'll see that um, the Public Protection and Advocacy Bureau houses different divisions, um, including the Civil Rights Division, along with others that help workers, that help consumers, and that help um, basically insurance policyholders and, and other um, consumers of financial services products in, in the Commonwealth. On the next slide, we'll see, uh, and the slide after this one, we'll see that uh, there are some basics as far as um, the obligations um, for landlords and tenants. And this is the baseline that um, exists for every landlord and tenant re relationship in the Commonwealth. So on the tenant side, um, this is something that most of us know, the tenant has to pay their rent and follow the rules that they agree to when they first enter um, that relationship with the landlord. And the tenant also has to um, accept responsibility for damages um, that uh, we describe as beyond normal wear and tear. And what this means is everyone knows that um, using a rental unit means that there is gonna be some wear and tear um, to the unit. So, you know, the floors might get scuffed up, things like that. But sometimes things happen and uh, something might get broken um, that doesn't usually get broken. So for example, um, if uh, for some reason um, there's an accident and, and there um, is tiling in the kitchen that um, is cracked due to a heavy object falling onto the tiling. That might be something that at the end of the um, the tenancy or the lease, the tenant may be responsible um, for uh, covering. And typically that's done through the security deposit, which we'll talk a little bit more about later on. Now on the landlord side, um, the basic uh, requirements, and I'm not saying that these are the only requirements, but a couple of the more basic requirements um, include providing the tenant with an apartment that's safe and clean and that um, meets the requirements that are set out under the Commonwealth's sanitary code. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a um, couple slides. Also, the landlord has to fulfill the promises that they make to the tenant in, in the lease or whatever agreement that they make with the, with the tenant at the outset. So um, next, let's talk about some of the things that one should know um, as a landlord and as a tenant at the outset. So when, when it comes time for um, uh, a tenant to, to begin their, their tenancy, um, there are certain things that landlords can um, require the tenant to pay at the very beginning. <clears throat> so a couple of the more common things, so first and last month's rent um, and the last month's rent can't be uh, a larger amount than the first month's rent, so they have to be um, equal. And then a security deposit um, is, is fairly common, and that uh, amount also has to be um, no more than the uh, first month's rent. Um, and if the landlord ends up charging the tenant um, a security deposit and the last month's rent, then they are supposed to provide the tenant with a receipt um, for um, those, those payments and some st statement showing that they charged the tenant those amounts. Um, the, the last thing that a, ten that a landlord can charge a tenant um, is uh, for the cost of uh, um, basically replacing the, the locks and keys to in order to install a, a new set of locks. Um, 
um, their apartment door. So those are really the four things that uh, landlords um, can charge at the very beginning. And um, outside of those four things, it's very unlikely that um, the uh, Commonwealth's laws and rules permit a landlord to, to charge anything more. Um, okay, we can move on to the next slide. <clears throat> so there are a lot of rules that apply to security deposits. Um, and this is something that we usually find um, is not very commonly known, but basically um, when a landlord charges a security deposit, this is money that's meant to cover um, things that uh, might end up happening, um, not necessarily through the tenant's own fault, but maybe because an accident happens. So if there's some damage um, to the rental unit that isn't just like scuffs or, um, you know, things that um, happen to the paint, et cetera. Um, so, so this is what the security deposit usually is for. And if the landlord charges a security deposit, um, then uh, they have to give the tenant certain information. Uh, so they have to give the tenant, first they have to deposit that um, money in a bank account um, that accrues interest. And they have to provide the tenant with the information for the bank account, um, including the name and address of the bank that holds the account um, and the account number uh, where that tenant's um, security deposit is um, gonna be held for the time that they're a tenant. Now, um, as the security deposit is held, it's gonna start to accumulate interest. And uh, each year, the landlord is supposed to either pay the tenant whatever interest um, built up for that year, or let the tenant deduct that amount from um, the, their next rent payment. And because, security deposits um, or interest rates actually are, are really low, then this is usually not a very um, big amount of money, but it's still uh, the rule that the landlord is supposed to either give this money, this interest money to the tenant, or let them deduct that amount from um, the next month's uh, rent. <clears throat> now at the beginning, you know, how do you, let's say at the very end, um, uh, the, the tenant is moving out and, and there might be some things uh, that, that um, are wrong with the apartment. Um, how, how does the tenant um, and landlord know that those things weren't already um, broken or, or damaged at the very beginning? Well, technically the, the landlord is supposed to provide a tenant at the very beginning of the tenancy, something that's called the statement of condition. And this document is supposed to describe the condition of the apartment and also describe any damage that exists set in the apartment at the time that the tenant is moving in. Um, <clears throat> but a lot of times this doesn't happen. Uh, but as a tenant, um, you don't need to necessarily um, wait to uh, have the landlord give you the statement. You can actually prepare one on your own. Um, and you can document the things that you see in the apartment that um, aren't, um, that, are, that might be damaged or, or need to be fixed. Um, and you do this at the very beginning of, of when you move in uh, and put this in writing and give a copy uh, to the landlord so that you have some proof that you notify the landlord at the very beginning of certain issues that exist in the apartment. Um, now, the final thing to know uh, about security deposits is that when the tenancy ends, when the tenant is gonna be moving out, the landlord has to return that security deposit and whatever interest may be um, um, you know, added to that uh, within 30 days of the tenancy ending. So if the person's lease is for a year, um, you know, uh, the end of June through to the, uh, or let's say the first day of July through to the end of June, following year, when that person moves out the end of June the following year, the landlord has 30 days after that point, so the end of July, um, in order to return that security deposit. And if they don't, then there could be a potential issue there um, that the tenant might be able to do something about. Okay, move on to the next slide. So, <clears throat> Mass so Massachusetts, there, there's a law 
that um, sets minimum requirements for uh, rental units that landlords have to comply with. And this basically um, is what uh, requires uh, landlords to provide a, a decent place of living to, to tenants. Um, now, the, the things that uh, landlords have to uh, do to comply with the sanitary code um, can can be very, very, it could be a very, very long list. But, um, you know, for example, I think the basics would include um, for apartments, uh, having heat, hot water, electricity. Um, you have to have kitchens and bathrooms with, with sinks in them and running water and the doors and windows to the apartment has to, they have to have locks. Um, but there is a very long list of other requirements that um, landlords must meet. Um, and I would encourage um, those of you who are watching this to um, um, seek out some additional information about what may be required of landlords um, um, by going to a couple of resources that we can, I think, uh, maybe discuss or, or even um, distribute either at the end of this or, or afterwards. Um, but so, um, you know, the basics are that the sanitary code it, it requires that the unit be habitable. That, that's another way of saying that the unit has to be comfortable and clean enough for someone to live there safely. And if it turns out that there's a violation of the sanitary code, like for example, the doors and windows don't have locks um, and the tenant complains about this to the landlord, um, the landlord maybe doesn't address the issue. At that point, the tenant can um, request their um, town or city's um, uh, inspectional services department or department of health um, to send an inspector out and uh, do an inspection of the rental unit to determine whether there are any sanitary code violations or not. If there are, then that inspector will issue a notice to uh, the landlord that lists what the violations are and gives the landlord a certain amount of time um, to fix the violations. And depending on the seriousness of the issue, uh, the landlord might have as little as 24 hours to fix the violation um, or um, even uh, um, up to 30 days to fix certain violations. It just depends on the seriousness of the violation. Um, if the landlord fails to fix the issue within the amount of time that they have, then it's possible that the inspectional services department or department of health could uh, uh, try to issue penalties against the landlord or even bring an enforcement case against the landlord. It's also possible that uh, the tenant could be able to withhold some rent to account for um, the violations that exist in the apartment. Um, because if there are sanitary code violations, then arguably um, the unit is not uh, necessarily um, worth the rate that the landlord is charging the tenant at the very beginning, which is like the market rate. Um, one thing that everyone should be careful about though, uh, if this is a situation you find yourself in is to make sure to go over this with an attorney if you can before withholding rent, because if you um, fail to make your full rent payments, this could be a violation of your lease and a landlord could um, technically uh, uh, start um, eviction proceedings because of the, of the lease violation. Uh, we can move on to the next slide. So um, there was a eviction moratorium in place um, in Massachusetts, but that expired on October 17th. Um, and currently there is a federal uh, eviction moratorium in place that covers certain tenants um, who are impacted by COVID-19. Um, and that is in place through at least December 31st, 2020. It's possible that the CDC could extend this. Um, it's possible that it will expire on December 31st. <clears throat> but part of the requirement for a tenant to be protected under this um, moratorium is that they have to provide a, a declaration to their landlord. And, and this is a form that you can find online uh, along with other information about um, the different uh, requirements that you have to meet in order to be eligible um, to uh, 
uh, be covered by this moratorium. Um, but another thing to keep in mind is that this moratorium is really meant for people um, who have been financially affected uh, by COVID-19, either because um, you know they were laid off, lost employment, um, you know they had hours cut, or they have um, had to pay significant medical expenses um, in connection with uh, the pandemic, things of that nature. So if if those kinds of uh, um, you know losses uh, don't don't apply in someone's situation. Um, then um, it, it's in the tenant's best interest to continue to keep paying rent if they're able um, to do so. Um, so this is just the next slide is another slide reinforcing this um, that um, sort of uh, um, information that that the moratorium. Um, even the Massachusetts moratorium that expired, but uh, the, under the CDC moratorium, this, this doesn't mean that a tenant is not obligated to, to pay their rent. The rent obligation continues. Um, uh, it's just that if their tenant is unable to pay their rent because of these reasons, the, the landlord is um, not able to um, uh, evict them physically um, until after the, the moratorium is, is over, assuming that they have a court order giving them permission to do so. Um, uh, just because a tenant uh, can't pay rent and can't get evicted doesn't mean a landlord can't try to do things to uh, recover the uh, rent owed. Landlords can still bring cases in civil court um, to try to get money from um, the tenant, and that's different from eviction cases, but we won't be really getting into that tonight. Um, but I think if, if you find yourself in a situation where um, you've been impacted financially by COVID-19, you should be sure to notify your landlord uh, within 30 days of missing your rent payment. And you should seek out help um, to uh, access resources that might be available to you to help you either pay rent or to help you avoid um, eviction if, if you're unable to pay rent and, um, and the resources, other resources, resources available to you may, are, are not sufficient. Um, we're, we're trying to encourage landlords and tenants to try to work out payment plans that will allow um, tenants to remain housed and that will also, um, you know, get landlords the rent that they um, are, are due under their uh, leases with tenants. Um, next slide. Um, this will be covered in, in more detail later on, so I don't want to spend much time on this, but um, you might have heard that. Um, <clears throat> You know, the governor uh, ha has uh, put up a, a eviction diversion initiative and funded it with $100 million to help families throughout the Commonwealth um, with rental assistance to help them pay rent that they might owe or, or can't afford to pay moving forward. Um, and this has made uh, uh, money available to households uh, from 4,000 up to 10,000, depending on the household circumstances, um, and, and is something that is really crucial and, and might be available to you if, if you find yourself in a situation where you are owing rent or you have concerns about being able to continue affording your rent um, because of a financial issue um, caused by COVID. Um, the, the funding is administered through what's called housing consumer education centers. Um, so there's an education center in, in each region throughout the Commonwealth, um, but I think that that might get covered later on. So I think we can move on to the next um, slide. And I'll try to move quickly now because I know that we don't want to run over time. So retaliation. Um, the law prohibits landlords uh, from from taking um, some sort of negative action against their tenant um, in response to their tenant, trying to um, you know, assert their rights uh, uh, about something. So for example, if a tenant has uh, lost their um, heat or hot water during the winter and the landlord isn't doing anything to fix the issue and the tenant decides that they're going to call their inspectional services department to get an inspector out and um, hopefully get the, them to, to require their landlord to do the fix. If the landlord um, doesn't like that and decides that they want the tenant out because they don't want to 
um, be forced to do something they don't want to do, um, and then they bring an eviction case that would be considered retaliation, which is unlawful under the Commonwealth's laws and rules. <clears throat> so you can't be evicted for, for exercising your rights. There are various rights that you have as a tenant. Um, and I guess the bottom line is if you feel like your landlord is doing something in response to you exercising a right, um, you should try to speak with someone in case that is uh, retaliation and in case that's um, something that the law prohibits. Next slide. So um, eviction can be very scary. I, the bottom line and the takeaway here um, that, that I hope um, um, you all get is that it is really a, a multi-step process um, that doesn't happen um, overnight or even during, you know, over the course of one week. Um, there are various requirements that have to be met. Um, and until the landlord gets a court order uh, from a judge that gives them permission to evict someone from their rental unit, the landlord is not allowed to do anything to kick that person out. So the process begins with a landlord giving the tenant um, something that's commonly referred to as a notice to quit. This is basically just a letter that's telling the tenant that the landlord uh, uh, wants them out by a certain date um, due to certain um, you know, either violations of the lease or um, maybe the lease is up and the landlord doesn't want to renew it. Um, once the tenant receives that, um, if, if the uh, tenant doesn't leave by the um, date that the landlord puts in that notice to quit, then at that point, um, that doesn't mean that the landlord gets to kick you out. That only means that the landlord can now go to court um, and, and bring the case to get the court's permission to kick you out. So the landlord ends up filing um, a complaint uh, in the court and gets a summons and serves as summons on the tenant. Um, and that basically gives the tenant um, notice that there's been a case filed against them in housing court or maybe in district court. So at that point, once a complaint has been filed and served along with the summons on the tenant, the tenant has a certain period of time to respond um, to that complaint in writing. Um, and, and in that answer, they are basically uh, providing the reasons why they believe they shouldn't be evicted. There might be um, many reasons why they believe they shouldn't be evicted. And some of the more important reasons could include things like there are very bad conditions in the apartment, or maybe the landlord started the eviction case because they're retaliating against them for uh, exercising their rights. So that's the opportunity the tenant has to try to persuade the court that they um, do not, uh, that they, they can continue living in the apartment. Um, if the tenant doesn't end up submitting the answer within the time that they um, have to do so, they, they can still try to um, you know, bring the answer with them to court um, and the court might still accept it, even if they hadn't provided it earlier. But um, once, once the uh, court date comes and the tenant will get um, notification of when that is, then at that point, um, it, it becomes a matter of the landlord and the tenant explaining to the judge um, why uh, the tenant shouldn't be um, evicted or, or why the landlord should be allowed to evict the tenant. And the judge will decide um, whether the landlord can or cannot evict the tenant and give some sort of time period um, for uh, uh, the tenant to continue being in the rental unit until the landlord can technically um, get someone to physically remove the tenant. Um, but overall, uh, you should just know that as a tenant, you may have defenses to the eviction that are important and that you can raise in your answer or raise during court. Um, and, and as a landlord, um, you have to follow these um, legal requirements and these steps. You can't just uh, kick somebody out without um, going through the legal process that's required. Next slide. Um, so our office has a eviction help request form available online that you can access and fill out if you're facing a situation where you're being evicted either um, you know, your landlord has brought a case against you or your landlord is trying to evict you without going through court. 
And that's the link um, that you can go to to access that form and, and fill that out. So I think that might get um, distributed to you all later on as either part of the presentation or um, through some other means. Um, next slide. <clears throat> So uh, something that is usually what um, I work on as a, an attorney in the Civil Rights Division is housing discrimination. And um, unfortunately, it's very common and it can take many, many forms. So we don't have time to discuss tonight what kinds of forms it can take, but you know, it can happen at any point um, in the housing search uh, process or even after a tenant has started to live in an apartment. Um, so for example, um, when you apply for an apartment, um, something might happen in that application process that could be considered discrimination under the law. Or after you move into the apartment, something that ha can happen afterward um, that could be considered discrimination under the law. But it's important to know that um, it's illegal um, in Massachusetts to discriminate against um, someone. Um, because of their, in housing, because of their race, color, national origin, ancestry, gender, marital status, religion, age, sexual orientation, gender identity or expression, military background or disability. Um, and as I mentioned, discrimination can take many forms. It can be um, against uh, one particular tenant in a household of a few tenants. It could be against the household itself. Um, but the bottom line is that it's unlawful to um, do something, take some sort of adverse action or a negative action against uh, someone applying for an apartment or one of your tenants based on any of these listed reasons. Um, so one reason that's not listed here is source of income. So it's important to know that um, in Massachusetts, um, if you are, for example, a Section 8 voucher holder, um, or if you apply for and receive something like RAFT in order to help you with moving expenses or to find a new apartment or even to pay rent arrears, that it is unlawful for landlords um, and even real estate agents to discriminate against you based on those um, characteristics. Um, and that's also something that the office will be addressing soon uh, by releasing um, an advisory um, that I think will circulate to Riverside um, and our mass support. And, um, and there's also a, a booklet that we have available on the Attorney General's website that addresses uh, source of income discrimination specifically that um, we can also provide. Uh, next slide. So just a couple left and then I can finish up. So housing scams, it's something that is very common, unfortunately. Usually this takes the form of you know, someone searching for an apartment, sight unseen, um, they apply for it, they think they get an apartment, they um, go in person to go move in, and all of a sudden, um, you know, someone's already living there, it turns out the apartment doesn't exist, something along those lines. Um, so it's important to know that, you know, it's easy to fake listings online. Um, and uh, if you can, it, it's better to use a licensed real estate broker or um, a salesperson to find an apartment. Uh, there's a resource that you can use to verify someone's license online. Um, but if that's, you know, regardless of whether or not you do that, use a broker, agent, or salesperson. Um, some things to keep an eye out for are um, when you look at apartment ads, whether the ad is poorly written. Um, if something seems like too good to be true, like a, a very cheap rent for the amount of space you get or, um, you know, so close to convenient like um, um, MBTA stations, things like that for the amount of rent being charged. And it might be in fact too good to be true. Um, or maybe if the ad itself um, or after you contact the person who posted the ad, they request uh, payment from you um, using methods that are untraceable um, uh, like wire transfers, for example then you should be um, on alert that that might be a scam. Also, um, never under any circumstances <clears throat> give somebody your social security number um, or PayPal account information uh, to someone that you only met online. Um, and if you are a victim of an online apartment scam, there is a website you can go to to file a complaint with the FBI. Um, that's here at the bottom of the slide, it's IC 
looks like ic3.gov. Um, next slide. So as I mentioned, the Attorney General's office has some resources available um, for different areas um, based on the current pandemic. So our general resource page is listed here and then there's a guide to landlord and tenant rights on the website as well. Um, next slide. In order to um, file a complaint with us um, about um, an unfair deceptive business practice, you can always call us at this phone number. Um, that's our consumer hotline um, or file an online complaint form. And this is separate from that help request form that I mentioned earlier. Um, and, and then on this final slide, um, these are all the hotlines that um, might be relevant to you um, and are uh, um, very issue specific. So there's a consumer hotline, civil rights division has its own hotline. So if you think you've been discriminated against, you can call us there to file a complaint. And there's also other hotlines listed below. I think I'll um, try to finish up um, so I don't take up too much more time. Um, thank you. Thank you, David. I believe that's the last part of our slides. Um, just a few questions, um, David, some people had was, can a documented person apply for RAFT? And that is yes, um, they can apply for RAFT. There are no immigration restrictions. And I know um, somebody from DHCD, which is the Department of Housing and Development, will be talking next a little more about RAFT. So this will be a great transition. And a, a last question somebody asked David was, what can happen if the tenant has a co-signer? Could the landlord kick the tenant out if the co-signer refuses to pay? Um, okay, so as to that um, last question about co-signers, um, I think that really gets to uh, whether or not there's rent owed, um, because if there is rent owed, then the co-signer is on the hook uh, for that rent. So if that rent isn't paid, um, then yes, the, the landlord can um, resort to eviction and get that tenant out of the um, apartment. Um, and as a co-signer, um, that, that person can be on the hook for any rent that's owed. So the landlord, if they decide to go after the tenant and the co-signer for, for the money, um, and this is apart from the eviction, they can file a lawsuit um, in civil court to try to get a judgment against the co-signer and the tenant um, and to try to uh, collect on that judgment um, uh, later on. Thank you so much, David. And I know at the end of today's um, presentation, there will be a Q&A section as well. Um, they are, there was somebody that asked that they were looking to have more information for homeowners who, who have a hard time paying mortgage. Um, one important information for the person who asked that question is that on our mass.gov um, COVID-19 research page that David mentioned, you could have a section there that, that has some resources, especially for homeowners as well. So thank you everyone. And I'll leave the platform to the next presenter. Thank you so much, Yelenis and David for that very pertinent information. Um, next, we are going to hear from Amy Mullen. Amy Mullen is the program director for the RAFT and home base programs at the Department of Housing and Community Development. She joined DHCD in 2016 after previously working at two other local housing nonprofits, Metro Housing Boston and Heading Home. Amy earned her Master of Public Administration degree from UMass Boston in 2019. Welcome, Amy. Hi, good evening, everyone. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, thank you to Mass Support for hosting this town hall um, to make sure this important information gets out to everyone who needs it throughout the Commonwealth. Um, thanks to everyone who's listening today for joining us. I'm gonna talk about two emergency rent and mortgage assistance programs, RAFT and IRMA. IRMA is a new program um, whereas RAFT is an existing program that's been expanded um, during COVID. And like David mentioned earlier, both programs are part of the Baker Polito Administration's Eviction Diversion Initiative. Um, so tonight I'm gonna talk about eligibility for both of these programs and how tenants, homeowners, and homeless households can access them. 
So um, Raft is a program that's been around for a while. Uh, many people may already be familiar with it, but if you're not, um, it's a program that pays up to $4,000 in assistance to prevent homelessness. It, um, as of recently, as of about two months ago, um, we can also pay up to $10,000 to prevent eviction for renters who've experienced a financial hardship related to COVID-19. Um, but that's not the only group of people who can access RAFT. It's still open to everyone who qualifies. Um, and RAFT serves households with income up to 50% of the area median income, or the AMI. Um, and it actually goes up to 60% AMI for households at risk of homelessness because of domestic violence. IRMA is a new program that launched on July 1st in response to COVID. And it is similar to RAFT in a lot of ways. Um, the big difference is that it helps people with slightly higher income than RAFT. Um, so RAFT goes up to 50% AMI. Um, IRMA can actually serve households with income between 50 and 80% AMI. So it goes up quite a bit higher to try to reach um, folks with a little bit higher income who still um, need some assistance. And that's for renters or homeowners, as is RAFT. Um, so I know there was a question earlier about you know, is there assistance for people who are behind on mortgage? And RAFT and IRMA can help in both of those situations um, if the homeowner has low to moderate income under these limits. Um, applications for assistance go through the regional administering agencies or the RAAs, which are 11 nonprofits throughout the state who contract with DHCD to administer the programs in their regions. Um, and I'll just know, I'm not gonna get into these, but many RAAs administer other local or private funds as well. So after COVID, we saw some federal assistance come to states and uh, municipalities, and a lot of cities and towns created their own rental assistance programs. Um, so the RAAs administer some of those and know about a lot of them um, throughout the state. So if you you know are working with someone who, um, needs more assistance than what RAFT or IRMA can provide, um, there may be additional funds that they can tap into. So these are the 11 RAAs that offer RAFT. Um, and they each have their own region. So they're the nine consumer housing consumer education centers um, that I believe David mentioned earlier, the HCECs. And then there's two additional um, nonprofits who don't have HCECs, but who do have RAFT funds. And that's the Lynn Housing Authority and Neighborhood Development and the Central Mass Housing Alliance in Worcester. So um, of course, many RAAs are operating remotely during the pandemic. DHCD, um, our office is fully remote, but um, the RAAs, some or most have some level of in-person services that they're offering, um, or they may have some staff who are in the office who can collect you know, mail and faxes. But at this point, most of the interaction with constituents um, seeking assistance and applying for RAFT and IRMA is being done remotely. Um, so related to that, each RAA's website is really the best source right now of information about how to do a RAFT application or get in touch with someone, um, a housing counselor or a case manager to talk about their situation um, as they, you know, close down or reopen, um, they, they put that information up on their websites, um, but really the, the websites are kind of the best um, place to go right now. Um, DHCD does provide a lookup tool at this link. Um, and if you go to mass.gov slash COVID housing help, there's a lot of information about both programs that includes a link to that lookup tool. Um, so if you search for, there's a drop down and you can look for any of the 351 cities and towns in Massachusetts, you click the one that um, the constituent lives in and that brings you to information about which RAA is the right one to contact along with their website um, and their phone number and their address. So for RAFT and IRMA, applicants need to apply at the RAA that covers the city or town that they're living in if they're applying for help to stay. Um, or if they're going to use the program to move, because RAFT can be used um, for moving assistance as well, they should apply at the RAA that covers the city or town that they're moving to. 
Um, so raft again up to four thousand um, dollars. It goes up to ten thousand for households facing eviction who have experienced a financial hardship related to COVID. Um, so we just heard about the different steps that a landlord has to take to actually evict a tenant, and folks can apply for the ten thousand dollar benefit or the four thousand dollar benefit before the landlords actually started that court eviction. Um, those of you who are familiar with RAF from a few years ago may remember it for a while it was a requirement um our RAF could only serve households who were already at that late stage where they were you know involved in a court eviction and, and really really imminently close to becoming homeless um with this funding we're able to help people both at that court stage but also before um so a household who's maybe fallen behind one month and the landlord hasn't taken action yet but could um, or even for COVID, people who have lost their jobs and know that they're going to fall behind but haven't yet, they can still apply at that stage. It's really intended to be a flexible benefit that can meet each household's unique needs. So it can help with a lot of different things. Um, it also serves households of all sizes and configurations who are at risk of homelessness. So um, it used to be a requirement that folks needed to have a dependent child under 21 or um, be pregnant to qualify because the, um, the funds were targeted to families with children, but that's no longer the case. Um, and I just highlight that because we, we do get some questions um, sometimes from people who think that that's still a requirement. And so we're trying to get the word out that it's, it's not um, any type of household, um, you know, single person, an elderly couple, someone with adult children, um, everyone can, can qualify um, and be found eligible if they're at risk of homelessness and they meet the income eligibility criteria. Um, so down here are a few, oh, sorry, if you can just go back to the previous slide, just a few different um, things that we can pay for. So it's, um, most people use it to pay rent arrears. So back rent that, you know, they weren't able to pay that the landlord is now collecting on. But we can also use it to help people with ongoing rent in the form of rent stipends, um, moving costs, again, mortgage assistance for homeowners, utility payments, um, startup costs like a security deposit, a first and last month's rent and furniture, and more. Um, it's really intended to be a flexible response to whatever housing emergency the person's facing. Uh, so these are the list of eligible housing crises that um, the standard RAF program can help with. And I'll talk about some of the COVID changes in a moment. Um, but eviction is really the big one. And that's kind of, again, court and before court. Um, the, I would say in a normal year, about half of the funds go to people who are trying to get help to stay in their rental unit. Um, we don't have you know a ton of data yet on the payments in COVID, but I think it's actually even higher than that. There's a lot of people at risk of eviction um, trying to use the funds to stay where they are and not, you know, not become homeless and not have to move. Um, that being said, we also help folks who, you know, aren't renting, but maybe they're um, living with a family member or staying on someone's couch. Um, that's what we call doubled up and asked to leave. We can help people with moving costs to kind of get out of that situation and get into their own housing. Um, we can help if people are at risk really due to any kind of health or safety um, crisis, as well as foreclosure for homeowners, um, overcrowding, domestic violence, fire and flood, natural disaster, um, a utility shut off, and really any other crisis that's going to result in the person losing housing um, imminently. And again, it pays for expenses related to resolving that whatever housing crisis they've presented to the RAA with. Go to the next slide. Um, so again, during the, after COVID or in response to um, the onset of COVID, um, the Baker Polito administration announced additional funding to RAF for households who have who are kind of eligible for raft, that same group of people that would have normally gotten raft, but um, people who are in that situation because of COVID. And so that could mean a lot of different things. I think the most common is, you know, someone whose um, workplace was shut down, maybe a restaurant worker suddenly lost hours and was no longer able to pay the rent. 
but it could also be, and we've had applications from people who, um, you know, with their kids at home all the time now doing remote schooling, their grocery bill has gone up and their money's going to groceries instead of rent. Or, um, you know, they had to buy new Chromebooks because the kids' schools didn't offer them for, for remote learning. Um, there's a lot of different ways that COVID has impacted people financially. And so this funding is intended to help those people with their housing costs um, during COVID. Uh, we've also been able to introduce some new flexible policies to make the RAP application process a little simpler. Um, and these apply to all types of RAP, not just the, the funds that are set aside for um, COVID situations. Um, so we were able to relax some of the requirements for documentation. Um, households no longer need to show their social security cards or their kids' birth certificates. We can take just an ID from the head of household. Um, we've kind of gone virtual, um, applications are online and folks can e-sign them instead of having to sign with a, with a pen, although they can still, you know, they can do either or. Um, again, a court summons is no longer required to help people with rent arrears. And if someone's applying because of COVID, we can help them before they fall behind kind of in advance with future rent. And um, we have come out with a new shorter application and we actually just made it a little bit shorter than that in October to really make it, you know, the REAs are getting a lot of applications and we wanna help people apply faster and complete their application more thoroughly the first time um, and make it easier for the REAs to review them. Um, so there, I mean, there is a lot of, um, there's a lot of applications kind of in process right now. Um, I saw some, questions in the chat about kind of wait times and how long it takes to hear back. Um, it is, we're asking people to be as patient as they can right now while working really um, closely with the RAAs to try to speed up processing and get the funds out to um, households who need them as soon as we can. I'll also just mention on the social security card, um, there was a question earlier about you know, immigration status. There's no immigration requirement for RAFT um, or immigration status requirement. So undocumented households can apply and they don't need to have a social security card. Um, our application asks for a social if someone has one, but if they don't have one because they've never been assigned one, they can just leave a blank um, or say, you know, not applicable. And there's no, um, that doesn't impact their eligibility at all. Um, next slide, please. Great. Um, and so as of October 19th, just about two months ago, um, we introduced the higher benefit above $4,000. Um, so tenants at risk of eviction are now able to access between $4,001 and $10,000 if they meet these three criteria. Um, so one, they, their financial hardship is related to COVID in some way. Um, Two, the payment above 4,000 will keep them stably housed for at least six months um, or until the end of June for households with school-aged children, whichever is later. But now that we're coming up on January, those two things are you know, effectively the same. Um, but we're looking, if we pay off this higher benefit, it's gotta pay off in that it keeps the household there for at least six months. Um, and the tenant um, is required to pay at least 30% of whatever their income is at the time of the application toward their future rent. Um, and RAFT can kind of help with that if the rent's not affordable on their current income. Uh, that's just for people in market rent housing. People in subsidized housing, of course, their subsidy will, will help pay with the rent or pay for the rent. So um, we would just pay for arrears for someone with a subsidy because um, they you know, wouldn't need a stipend payment. And then um, some households are referred to RAFT by the courts um, or by community mediation programs, in which case the mediator might work on that agreement between the tenant and the landlord. Um, but if someone isn't working with a mediator, the RAA can um, either negotiate an agreement with the tenant or landlord, or they actually have the ability to refer out to the community mediation centers if, you know, it's a tough relationship with the tenant and landlord, or you know they owe so much money that there's going to have to be a, a pretty substantial agreement. They might refer that out um, to someone with you know a little more formal mediation experience. But um, some of those agreements are being handled in house with the REA as well. Um, so really, every REA has a sort of 
it's sort of its own application process. Um, there's they all use the same application, but again, some are online. Um, some use slightly different application tools for the online application. Um, so really, the best way to find the application is to go to their websites. Um, so the application timeline, you know, it varies. It could be you know two weeks at some of the smaller RAAs to six or more weeks at some of the larger RAAs. And that really depends on a lot of different things. Um, you know, how complete the file is when it comes in, um, if the person uploaded all of the requested documents with their application, um, how responsive the landlord is. You know, there's a lot of moving pieces to a wrapped application um, and an IRMA application. Um, but again, we are working really closely with the RAAs to get these response times down as quickly as we can, um, especially as we near the end of the CDC moratorium. And I think I heard that we're um, holding questions till the end. Sorry, this is a slide from a different presentation, but um, yeah, thank you all very much. Thank you so much, Amy. So actually, we're gonna we're gonna go ahead and ask some questions right now, if that's okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, and there was a question that came up: um, Can you be denied raft if you have back rent owed? Um potentially that wouldn't be kind of the reason for denial, but um, people can be denied for raft if they're over income. Although in that case, they might just be referred to Irma. Um, you know, if their application is not complete or if their landlord refuses it. So we have seen, unfortunately, some cases where someone owes, you know, well over $10,000 and raft isn't going to be enough to stop the eviction. Um, in those cases, the person could possibly be denied for, um, you know, because the payment wouldn't kind of solve the eviction if the landlord's not going to forgive the rest of the rent. But um, the person could potentially use RAFT instead to move to a different unit. Um, so th there's options there. But um, yeah, owing back rent um, in most cases would would help um, someone qualify. Thank you so much. There was another question that came up um, on um, you know, if someone has a co-signer um, and they need some help um, with RAFT, um, would that be um, an issue? Um, what happens when a tenant needs help but has a co-signer on the lease? Do they not get help from their from these programs? Can they can they receive help? Yeah, if they've fallen behind um, and they owe the rent, they could they could. Qualify. Yeah, we wouldn't. The RAs wouldn't really look at whether or not there's a cosigner on the on the lease. Okay. And let's see. Um, it's another question here. Um, if an individual is currently unemployed with no income, could they still be eligible for the four thousand to ten thousand? assuming that the additional amount would be enough to stabilize their housing for six months? Or would the individual have to themselves prove sustainability by having a certain amount of income to pay for part of their monthly ongoing rent at time of the application? So um, what we need to see for that higher benefit is that yeah, that the housing will be stabilized for six months. So that could be um, a combination of RAF payments or tenant income or a combination. Um, so yeah, I mean, if $10,000 will pay for their back rent and their rent for six months, then um, that's fine as long as they're, if they do have income, as long as they're paying at least 30% of their income toward the rent. Thank you. And one more question. Can a landlord apply for raft for a tenant that owes back rent and get the money paid for that back rent? Yes, actually. Um, thank you for that question because I should have mentioned that. Um, we just launched a landlord application at each of the 11 RAAs. Um, it's a, so we're calling it the landlord door. It's a separate way for landlords to apply if their tenant, for whatever reason, can't or, you know, won't. Um, it's only open to small landlords. Uh, who own 20 or fewer units, and the tenant does have to sign a consent form. So it's not, 
Um, you know, it's not something the landlord can do on their own without the tenant's input. But if the tenant consents and says, you know, it's it's easier for whatever reason for the landlord to fill this out for me and go through the process than me alone doing it, um, the landlord now has that option and that's available on each RA's website. Good to know. Thank you so much. Uh, one more and then we will move on. Um, there was a question here about um, housing vouchers. Um, if you're able to, is it just in Massachusetts or if you have a, um, a housing voucher here in Massachusetts, can you bring it over to another state? That really depends. Um, there's a lot of different factors that might affect that. Um, the short answer is that if someone has a Section 8 voucher, that's a federal voucher and can be used in any state um, or U.S. territory, actually. Um, but sometimes the housing authorities or voucher administering agencies have rules about how long you have to stay in mass. Um, sometimes it's a year, but that really depends on the voucher. And so someone with a voucher um, who has that question should really talk to their leasing officer at their housing authority to find out the specific rules of their voucher. Um, if they have the mass rental voucher program, an MRVP voucher, that is just for Massachusetts. Thank you so much, Amy. So I know we're, we're going to try to um, have some more time for questions um, at the end of our uh, presentation. So um, I am going to go ahead and move forward and introduce our next panelist, um, Colby Andrade, um, who is a recent Master's of Social Work graduate from Bridgewater State University. And she is also um, an outreach crisis counselor for mass support. Welcome, Colby. Um, and thank you so much for being part of this presentation. Hi, everyone. Um, tonight, I'm going to be discussing the topic of remaining resilient, right? Um, so how do we remain resilient during a global pandemic? So what is resilience? Resilience is the ability to bounce back to life, returning stronger than ever before. It's a vital component to our health and well-being. Rather than being overcome by perceived failures, missed opportunities, or issues beyond our control, people who are resilient are able to find a way to carry on and thrive. So just some key factors that contribute to resilience are the ability to self-regulate, being flexible while having healthy boundaries with yourself and others, maintaining a positive outlook, supportive communication skills, seeing failure as an opportunity to grow. And all of these qualities can help us to accept change, um, adapt to difficult situations, keep things in perspective and help us overall take good care of ourselves. Being resilient doesn't mean that you never feel discomfort or experience distress or heartbreaking life events. In fact, often the road to resilience is paved with adversity, trauma, and a great deal of emotional dysregulation. It's important that we develop strategies and relationships that sustain our overall well being and capacity to build resilience when met with challenges. I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the three R's of self care reflection, regulation, and relaxation. So, reflection what is reflection about? So reflection is really just noticing your reactions and patterns um, to situations. And this can allow us to plan for how to engage in some intentional self-regulation and self-care. Reflecting on what you and the people around you are doing and systems you're working with, your relationships with them and what support that you might need is a vital part of reducing the impact of stress. Planning for how you can healthily cope with the impact of toxic stress. Regulation. So regulation is about the way that we choose to respond in the moment when we start to experience a stress response. Remembering that the people around you are also experiencing intense levels of stress 
right? We're all in this pandemic together. Someone, um, everybody is affected by this in some way or another. And we may all have strong emotional reactions and those um, strong emotions are contagious. So it's important to know what our own trigger points are and what upsets us, what activates you, what sort of makes you feel like you're experiencing that stress. And really practicing catching and releasing your own defensive reactions and then having some compassion for any self-protective tendencies. Most of all, noticing when you are reacting, stopping to take some time to calm yourself down when you get angry or hurt, asking for help and debriefing uh, with your supports when necessary. Relaxation is about keeping yourself strong and balanced, finding some balance in your life, making time for yourself to relax and play, whatever that means for you. Maybe you like to play a board game with your household members. Maybe you like to binge watch some Netflix, do yoga or meditation. Maintaining that social support system. So FaceTiming with friends if you can't see them, um, calling people on the phone, writing a letter. Maybe you do a Zoom game night or a Zoom movie night. And your sense of humor, um, laughing a little bit, doing things that make you feel at home with yourself. And just remember to be gentle, patient, and realistic with yourself as we are all in this together. And if anyone has any questions. Colby, thank you so much for that. So important for us to, um, you know, have those three R's and, and you know, manage um, and, and have some coping strategies throughout this really difficult time. So thank you so much for your presentation. I'd like to go ahead now and bring out our panelists um, once again. Uh, we have several questions um, that I'm hoping we could get to. Um, if you're available for a few more questions, um, David, Yarlenis, and Amy, um, I have some questions coming up and I was hoping maybe we could answer some of them before we finalize our, our event this evening. Um, and let's see. So I have a question here. Um, are there RAA community liaisons that come out to speak to programs about these benefits? I'm assuming that might be for Amy. Yeah, um, so all of the RAAs do some level of, um, you know, education and information in the communities um, outreach. They don't, um, it probably looks different at every RAA, but I would say if you, you know, are looking for um, a presenter in your specific region, so yeah, maybe reach out to that um, RAA and see what they can offer in terms of having someone come out. Thank you so much. Um, another question. Can people on disability apply for RAFT? Sorry, I lost my mute button for a second. Um, yes, yep, there's no um, any, as long as they have income under 50% AMI and they're experiencing a housing crisis, there's no rules about like what type of income they have. Um, anyone who meets the income eligibility and has a housing crisis is welcome to apply. Thank you. And one more, Amy, is there a limit to applying for and receiving RAFT or um, IRMA funding? Yep, so RAFT is um, 4,000 or up to 10 for this, for COVID um, under certain circumstances, and then IRMA is four, and that's in a 12 month period. So, you know, someone could hypothetically get $2,000 in RAF now and come back in six months and get the other 2,000. Um, it doesn't have to be kind of all at once, but um, once they hit that limit, they are, um, you know, they can't get more until the year has passed. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. um, we have another question. 
is Irma available to people who are working full time, but their income isn't enough to afford an apartment and they need to move out as a result of COVID? So Irma cannot be used to help people move, but it can be used to keep them in their current housing. Um, so it can pay rent arrears or rental ongoing rental stipends, um, and it can pay mortgage arrears or ongoing mortgage stipends. But um, if they're looking to use RAP or to, to get funds to move, they'd have to access RAFT instead of Irma. Thank you, Amy. I think this question might be going over to David or Yelenis. Um, the question is, I have a client whose apartment burnt down and him and his family are now homeless. And the landlord states he's not responsible for finding him a new place. What exactly are his responsibilities to his tenants? Um, I'll be frank, I actually don't know the answer to that question. Um, um, there may or may not be responsibilities the landlord owes to those tenants for various reasons, um, including whether or not the fire um, somehow has um, some connection to the landlord's responsibilities. But um, I think if, if if that person is interested, they are certainly welcome to call our consumer hotline um, and hopefully someone um, will be able to respond to their question more specifically. Thank you, David. Thank you so much. I want to let our, our um, viewers, our audience know that uh, we do have um, our team from Mass Support who is behind the scenes and putting um, these um, resources out online and uh, we will be giving you some more information before the end of this presentation on um, how to get in touch with Mass Support as well if you have any other questions um, that we're not going to be able to get to tonight. Um, but before I do that, let me just be mindful of the time. Um, someone is asking, hi, how do I apply? Amy, um, I think there was a um, resource um, online on how to do that, correct? That was on one of the slides. Yep, um, if you go to mass.gov slash COVID housing help, there's information as well as a um, resource lookup tool where you can find out which REA to go to. Thank you so much. All right, I think, um, I think right now that is it for our questions. And um, I would like to go ahead and also give out some resources. Um, you know that this has been a really difficult time um, with COVID. And so um, Mass Support um, would like to go ahead and uh, reach out these resources uh, to all of you. Uh, for 24-7 emotional support, um, we do have the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline listed at 800-273-TALK, which is 8255, and the National Disaster Distress Helpline, 800-985-5990. And with Mass Support, our Crisis Counseling Program um, you can follow us on Twitter. Uh, you can follow us on Facebook at MassSupport.org. And our 888 number is 888-215-4920. Um, and the way that works, um, it is a um, free, anonymous, confidential line um, that any individual can call from 8 in the morning um, to eight at night, Monday through Saturday. And the way it works is there is a voicemail there and one of our team leaders will be checking on that voicemail and someone from one of our teams will be getting back to you. Um, you can also reach us at mass support at riversidecc.org. I want to 
thank all the panelists for being here this evening. Thank you so much for sharing all that information, those wonderful resources with our audience. Um, it was very, very much appreciated that you took uh, time out of your busy schedules to be here with us. Um, and from all of us at Mass Support, we want to thank you immensely for being here. It was uh, a pleasure meeting all of you, and um, I hope to see you all soon. <laughs>